yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kabian. I know some of you really well and some of you I don't know at all. But I'm glad to be here and share one of my biggest passions, which is microbes and fermenting. So my background is uh, pretty various, but uh, just recently I spent some time in Iowa working on two degrees. One was in sustainable living with a focus in soil science. And the other one was a pre-med degree with Ayurvedic training. So I kind of have a tendency to mix the spiritual, mystical with the scientific and find that overlap. And microbes are, they're there. They're, they're so magical and also fundamentally part of our, our, our DNA. All the cellular machinery that we use in our bodies and that plants use, it all came from when we used to be single cell organisms. So life on earth was single cells for billions of years and it innovated and created strategies and then diversified and became us and plants and everything alive. So the microbes basically evolved us to do their, to carry, like, carry them around and get things for them. We're, we're basically bags for, for their bidding and they control our brain. They control our mood, our cravings. So they're pretty magic. I think they're quantum, like they're so small that physics works a little different for them. So things like intention and our observations seem to affect them. And I think we can like sort of coax them to do, uh, to serve us and we serve them. It's a really beautiful thing. They're like the single pixel of life. It's like the smallest unit of, of life. I'm really obsessed with them. Uh, in Ayurvedic sense, they're, they're Agni, which is fire, digestion, transformation. They're the only ones that can break apart uh, larger molecules to like their monoatomic level. And when things are monoatomic, they act differently. So it's kind of, kind of a lot to go into, but so things can be a particle or a wave. Like if you inject a radioactive isotope into mycelium, you can read it miles away, like instant, instantaneously, because it's no longer a particle, it's a wave. So it travels at the speed of light. So that's weird. I don't really understand it. I don't think anybody does. But they're, to me, they're like in between the spirit world, like the metaphysical magic world and the physical world. Uh, that's just how I feel about them. <laughs> But they, they're what work in the soil to break down the, the rocks into bioavailable like, compounds that, that macro life can understand and utilize. So they're really important in, in gardening, in our, in our digestion. A lot of uh, our neurotransmitters are fabricated in the stomach. There's uh, the gut-brain axis. The, the vagus nerve travels down into your gut and it communicates with what's going on down there, and it informs a lot of our, our intuition, you know, that gut feeling that we have. Like, I think that's the microbes talking to us. And uh, they'll save us. They can break down toxins that are, so glyphosate, huge problem. Guess what? Acetic acid can break down glyphosate, which is a water-soluble persistent toxin. That's really bad. It just keeps cycling and poisoning, but it, it stops when you take it apart with acetic acid, which is vinegar. So that's pretty cool. There's a lot of really magical things about microbes. I could go on and on. I have a couple of resources that I really appreciate. This is my, my new favorite book. It's the Noma Guide to Fermentation. You guys familiar with Rene Redzepi? He uh, runs a restaurant called Noma. They're the best restaurant in the world several times over, like every year. I can't remember all the years that they win. But he's, he's all about the local terroir, is that how you say that word? The, the flavor of the land? Terroir. terroir. <laughs> so he's all about exploring his local environment and foraging. He's driven by uh, excellence and perfection and it's put him on the, t the world stage. So he's really cool. He has a boat that's a fermentation lab and they ferment all sorts of weird stuff. So yeah, if you're fermenting weird stuff, it's best to be on a boat because... <laughs> can get kind of wild. Um, so this has some kombucha recipes that are really awesome. Another one that I don't have with me is Sander Katz. Are you guys familiar with Sander Katz? Yes. Um, before I go on, where are you guys at with fermentation, your knowledge? Like if you've like been fermenting for years, you know everything, if you're just getting, like where are you at? 
Okay. Just started eating pickles. Just started eating pickles. <laughs> eating pickles. <laughs> All right, excellent. So, yeah, fermentation is, or culturing. I kind of like the word culturing better because it seems more sophisticated. <laughs> so that is the act of introducing a specific microbe to a specific substrate and getting a specific result. So there's a wide range of fermented foods, yogurts, kimchi, uh, soda used to be fermented before we mechanized it. Like, uh, you can ferment just about anything. The weirdest ferment I've ever seen is penguins stuffed inside of a seal skin and buried. Uh, yeah, it makes like a weird jelly. Anyway, <laughs> you can ferment a lot of different things. And the difference between fermentation and, and rot is you're creating a specific set of circumstances to invite a certain bacteria out of the air. They spore and bloom and they're just floating all around us. They're on our skin, uh, they're in our gut. They're about, they used to say 10 to 1, but they're thinking more, it's a 1 to 1 ratio of how many bacteria you have in your body, on your body, to human cells. So you're as much bacteria as you are a human. Uh, if you were to scrape it all together and put it in a bag, it'd be about five pounds. They, they're small, so there's more of them than there are of you, about. So that's kind of gross sounding, but you'd be dead without them, I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, this is a specific kombucha book that I really like by this, this German, Gunther Frank, or Gunther Frank, super amazing. Uh, he has a lot of amazing science in here, uh, you know the Germans are very precise, so this is a really cool book. Uh, this is one of the ones that I started with. I first got into culturing around 2002. I was going to seminars at the herb shop in Orem, and I met a belly dancing gypsy who gave me my first scoby, and I really took it seriously. Uh, I was into kung fu tea at the time, so it's like a meditative practice of like bringing your presence awareness and producing something that is sharpening your skills, your, your senses, and like just, I don't know if you know much about gong fu tea, but it's a meditative way of making tea. And then I, I sort of got turned on to the uh, water science, Yusuri Yamato, the water crystal guy, and how in, intention imprints on water. So I tried to do everything the best way that I could. I'd get crystal singing bowls and hike up and gather spring water and just do like the best ingredients that I possibly could. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a, quite a, a undertaking to try and make the best kombucha in the world. That's what I was going for. I may have done it. We'll see. You guys can be the judge. So I brought some to share. Uh, eventually I learned about Jun, which is a honey kombucha. So regular kombucha will be killed by honey because honey is antimicrobial. But the Jun culture is adapted to honey. And there's a myth that it comes from the Bon people of Tibet. And they live in a high mountain range and they don't have access to cane sugar, so they had to make dew. That's also debated. Like Sander Katz, who's an expert in fermentation, said that the hippies from Portland made that up because they wanted it to sound more magic and cool. And that it's just a regular kombucha culture that's been trained on honey. I don't know what to believe. But <laughs> <laughs> this is a culture. It's kind of not the most pretty culture. I wish that it was more developed. And the, the pellicle is, is sunk. There's a couple that are maybe a little prettier. But the pellicle is this top layer. And what that does is it eliminates com competing microbes from getting in there. It also serves as a life raft for the ones that like to breathe, the, the aerobic. There's anaerobic and aerobic microbes. One likes oxygen, one doesn't. You have a blend. And there's about five to 12 species of microbes in kombucha cultures, and they're all different depending on what region you're in, and it interacts with your region. So it's like uh, local honey, you know how it will give you immunity to the pollen because it's kind of exposing you to that. So these guys will develop strategies for the, uh, the pathogens and the problems in your area, and they'll educate your gut. So having a local culture is way better than having a, a store-bought commercial culture. Also, it's going to be more vital and and fresh because when you refrigerate it for too long and store it for too long, it, it, they're constantly dying off and not getting as, as healthy. Um, the pellicle is 
part of, people always refer to that as the SCOBY, which is kind of incorrect because the whole thing is a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. Um, and it's a micro, like model ecosystem. They all have little jobs that they do to make the final product. First thing they do is they take the, the sugar, which is a disaccharide, so it's glucose and fructose, and they separate it into monosaccharide, and that makes for quicker, easier fermentation. Alcohol is pr produced by the yeasts. It's the same yeast that they use in beer, like a, I'm blanking on the name, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, I think it is. Anyway, beer yeast, alcohol is produced, and then the, uh, the bacteria will, how do I turn this off? Is that? The fan runs once it's okay. off. Okay, I think that's off. So yeah, the, uh, the bacteria will take that alcohol and produce acetic acid and the glucose and produce glucuronic acid. And these organic acids will bind their emulsifiers. So they'll bind non-water soluble toxins in your liver and help them be eliminated. So like the sludge that builds up in your, your body is dissolved and excreted. So that's one of the best things about kombucha. As a probiotic, it's not that complicated. You're gonna have a way better spectrum of probiotics from something like kimchi, but it has probiotics, um, ones that are proven to be useful for humans, uh, lactobacillus, a handful of others. I don't actually know it's in mine because I haven't sent it away for sequencing yet because it's expensive, but this culture comes from Kombucha Camp, which is a really reputable dealer uh, online. You can order them like 25 bucks or something. And then Tara White, White Set, was that her name? Were you there, James, when Tara came through? Yeah, she has a bus. She does fermentation on wheels. She drives around like the Johnny Appleseed of fermenting and gives away cultures to people. So I took those two cultures and I, I mixed them together because I like diversity and I think that builds resilience. And then I brought the culture up to my favorite spot, uh, Rock Canyon in Provo, and I offered the substrate to the wild yeast and microbes. They, they bloom on a full moon, like everything is more active on the, the full moon, sort of uprising energy. Maybe you believe it, maybe you don't, but I, I get a kick out of that. I read about sake masters who would go to certain forests and certain moons of a year to catch a certain kind of yeast to make different kinds of sake. So I was inspired by that to wrangle some microbes out of the air. So this is a local culture and I've also put a lot of intention and love uh, into this. So I hope that you guys appreciate it nearly as much as I do. That was a lot of talking. Do you guys have any questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, so if you had kombucha and you had it in your fridge and then you brought it with you during the day, off and maybe it was sitting in your car and then you put it back in the fridge does that change in temperature does that affect the health benefits yeah the and also it will also change what is being expressed a couple of degrees will like you know sometimes you'll bring out more esters which are like fruity kind of flavors if you're and i'm just learning like more and more it goes infinitely deep um sometimes huge temperature swings shock it. And if it's, if it's an active living probiotic, refrigeration is just slowing it down. It's not stopping fermentation. That's why sometimes when you open a GT Dave's kombucha, it blows up all over you. It's because it's too old. It's been in the bottle too long. Yeah, and that's part of our industrial food system. And you, it's like the difference between buying a package of Nabisco cookies and getting grandma or mom's homemade cookies. Like, you can't compare. And I bet you guys hate spending three or four dollars a day on kombucha because it's expensive. So making it your own is super sustainable, really affordable, and it's a lot of fun. So yeah, to answer your question, those temperature swings are going to affect how it ferments, basically. It can stress it out, and once it runs out of food, it will die. It will reach, it'll reach a plateau where... And sometimes they'll go dormant instead of just dying. They'll turn into their spore forms and they can last a really long time in that form, but they're not as vital as like a per perky new fresh culture, right? Any other questions? Would you be able to bring it back to life after, I mean like revitalize it to its previous state if it was 
Yeah, if, it, if it's still alive, eventually you could get it to be vital again. Usually if, if it's not completely happy and healthy, I compost it and just start again. Because I, I, after the, the highest, best, most awesome strain, so try to keep it healthy. And maybe something like that will make it more resilient, like putting it through some ordeal might make it a stronger culture. But I don't know. If, it, if there's ever any sign of like, mold or it's not looking right or smelling right, I just throw it out and compost it. And it's, I feel like that's the best thing to do in those situations. Yeah. Um, so a really vital, healthy scoby or, or uh, kombucha mushroom is, is a variety of like 12 strains, some anaerobic and some aerobic? Well, yeah, they, they, they can function, mostly it's an aerobic culture, but some they can do a little bit of both. And this is something I don't quite have my brain around, but... It's, a, it's like 12 or... or it's a, it's, a, it's a, a, a... More than one, right? It's yeah, it's at, least, it's at least three to be a real kombucha culture, which would be your cerveciae, your, your Saccharomyces cerveciae, yeast. the alcohol from yeast, and then uh, Acetobacter, which is a, a vinegar forming and then gluconobacter which that's the one that makes the cellulose which is the the mushroom as you refer to technically not a mushroom uh, it looks slimy and weird like a mushroom so one of the old names for it was manchurian mushroom tea because its origin origin as best we know is in manchuria so you took your kombucha up and offered it to get wild sports to kind of add to your yeah i wanted to create more diversity and let yeah local. let yeah, yeah, get the local variety and let survival of the fittest take over. Also, microbes do something really weird called horizontal gene transfer, where they can share genetic information without sexual reproduction. So, yeah, it's fucking freaky. Uh, they could be like, oh, I figured out how to utilize this source of phosphorus that isn't available to you. Let me send you a, a, a bit of geno like genetic information, and then now you can do it too. And they can trade strategies like that. They also trade unfriendly stuff, like pathogenic viruses and things, right? Yeah, yeah. It's something I want to understand more, but it's, it's wild. It seems really weird to me that they can do that. This is actually, this slimy thing, it functions a little bit like a neural network. Like, it talks to itself, and they can develop strategies for how much food there is. They'll augment their metabolism. So they'll be like, Let's not reproduce so much. We only have like this much sugar left. Let's slow it down and like really get the best out of this. Or there's tons of sugar. They're like, yeah, let's make some babies. So <laughs> it's super weird. They're super smart. And this, this is the first example of like multicellular cooperation probably that we see on Earth is, is stuff like this. This is probably the same sort of goop that was in like the primordial early life in the oceans. So it's pretty cool. Any other questions? I could just, does the sugar make much difference? I, I like to use organic cane sugar if I'm using sugar. But I, I gave up on sugar because honey is cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm using a honey culture. Uh, this honey is from the Bagley family farms, their fifth generation beekeeper. They have about 300 hives that they keep in the Wasatch. Um, I'd like to do my own hives because even though they're doing all right and it's way more sustainable than any other sugar source, there's things that I think they could do better. I think I could do better. So eventually this, this company that I have started I'm about a year and a half in, uh, we want to be completely self-sufficient, make our own tea, make our own honey and all the medicinal herbs and fruits and things to flavor it and be completely uh, closed loop like that, you know, completely local. And that's called Rock Canyon. Rock Canyon elixirs. Elixirs, and that can be purchased. A lot of places. Up in Salt Lake, we are at Rugged Grounds Coffee Shop, uh, Kings Peak Coffee Roaster, Yoga Sune, and sometimes Omar's. But we're mostly in Utah Valley, and there's like maybe 12 places. Uh, find us on Instagram. We kind of are most active there. Uh, we do farmer market. Um, 
yeah, we're just getting started. So hopefully we'll be available in some, some uh, grocery stores, but we're not quite there yet. Um, let me pass the little SCOBY around. Let me find one that looks really good. Uh, this one's all right. And you'll notice there's, there's some strands of darker color stuff. Those are yeast strands. I affectionately refer to them as squiddies. And then the, the thing on the top, that clear sort of white, that's the, uh, the gluconobacter's cellulose. And like a lot of stuff is happening in that. Also, um, I don't see any cups. You guys can probably waterfall some of this. Oh, here, there's, there's cups right there. If you guys wanted to try some of this, uh, we could do it with food or maybe now. I don't know. What's, what do you think is best? Let's do it with let's the food. food. That sounds better. Yeah, let's do the food. So when making tea, I got to turn this up a little bit. Here we go. Sorry, I don't know how to really work this. Someone want to come help me with this thing? I let this get a little bit cool. Uh, boiling? Uh, just below boiling. So boiling is a little hot for tea. It can kind of damage the delicate nature of the tea. 180 is about the, the temperature you want, but you can get the visual when it starts giving these micro bubbles on the bottom that aren't quite making it to the surface. Those are called fish eyes, and that's about 180 degrees that'll happen. The kind of tea we're using is just a green tea, a pretty standard organic green tea. It doesn't really matter because it goes through such a drastic change. You, the, the type of tea, as long as it's quality nutrients, like it's not gonna make a difference. I used to try different types of tea and it all kind of ends up the same because of the massive transformation it goes through. Green tea. So normal kombucha is black tea and sugar and John is green tea and honey. And pretty much anything with nitrogen and phosphorus and, and caffeine is what it's accustomed to. So there's a couple other herbs that you can use. You can train it to a non-caffeine variety. Uh, usually you just do that over time as to not shock it because it's accustomed to a certain food source. Um, it'll do all right usually just if you use herbs with high volatile acids, like lavender, for example, any of the antibacterial herbs, like rosemary, that'll, that'll hurt your culture and it may not ferment. So there's some things that you can use and some things you can't. Uh, this book has the best information on that that I've ever come across. But just sticking with a good green tea is, is nice. Um, okay, so that's perfect. No, a lot of people do that, and like that gives a really rich flavor, and I really like that that combination. But I prefer green; it's lighter, it's crisper. Um, so, Should we, like, in yeah, come in closer. Uh, check this out. So, if you're not completely sanitary, you risk cultivating something you don't want. And there's a couple of ways that you can sanitize. Uh, one is with acid, which I'm gonna, that's why I have this starter culture here with a bunch of over sour kombucha. Uh, the other is scalding. These have already been sanitized, but just because they've been transported, I'm gonna put a little bit of this water in here. You'll crack your glass if you're not careful. So let it heat up slowly. Like tempering? Yeah, because the, the, the quick temperature change will cause like a stress to the glass. It'll just shatter. So I'll just do a little bit at a time, let it kind of get accustomed. I'm really scared I might crack it. You, if you do like a ball jar, those are more like heat resilient. This is actually really not the best glass for this, but it'll work. I'll just be patient. That's probably good enough. We'll just let it hang out, warm up. So there, I've measured out 10 grams, which I find is a pretty good ratio for a gallon. I don't like using bag tea because it kind of crunches them up and it doesn't let them like bloom. Like there's a, 
they call it the agony of the tea. When it gives up its goodness, it like opens the pores and expands. Mm. So I don't like to have it in tea balls or bags or anything. I like to give it room to breathe. So like, um, is it the gun, gunpowder type of green tea? It's just not rolled. I do use gunpowder green tea sometimes. Uh, this is just a loose leaf. This is a variety called Chun Mi. Just a pretty standard China green, like pretty middle of the road. I like the Chinese green teas the best. I find they have like the most balanced flavor. We could talk about tea for an hour or two. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> so the way I'm doing this now is the quick way. So I'm only gonna put maybe about half of this is gonna be, I might even do less than half going to be boiling water, or 180 degree water, and then I'm going to crash cool it with some other water, because... Will that um, make it shatter if you put the hot, cold in the hot? Or it's not as bad as going from cold to hot, okay. hot to cold, but yeah, it stresses it, stresses okay. the glass. Okay. It's actually because the molecules are like crashing into each other and stressing mm -hmm. their, their bonds, because okay. it's like they're moving fast or slow. Mm -hmm. So if you had tempered glass, you could avoid that. Yeah. Okay. You can also use stainless steel, which is what we use at our brewery. Don't use any other metal, though, because if it's not a stable metal, the acids will react and it will create a terrible taste and like a black. You don't want that. So don't use cheap metal. Uh, the, these lids that I have on here, they, they've got to come off. I've only put them on temporarily. So, because they'll, they'll start to corrode, mm -hmm. it'll be gross. So, so what, what lids do you use? Yeah. Plastic or no lid at all, like you want it to be breathing. I just was driving, so it's okay to put a lid on it for a little while. But normally I would just put a, a little, I, I like silk because it's magic. It's like piezoelectric, it's like little pyramids and I, I think it's cool. But anything that's breathable, if it's too breathable, like don't use cheesecloth because the fruit flies will crawl down in there. But like a butter muslin, like a tight weave cloth, or just even like a, a bandana. Tea towel? What's that? A tea towel? Yeah, anything that's going to let the gas exchange. So it needs to be, if you're brewing and you put your, your stuff away in a closet and it doesn't have adequate airflow, it won't ferment properly. It needs that oxygen. Um, it also needs to be protected from light because it, it's not evolved to withstand UV, it, it, that damages it, rips apart its DNA essentially. So you want to protect it from light, you want to keep it warm, and you want to have it ventilated. Those are the requirements mm, it for... It smells really good. Yeah. Get it on in there. Anybody else want to take a, a whiff of this green tea? I like this one. So I'm brewing this a lot stronger than what I would for if I, would, if I were to drink it. I usually do about 10 minutes or so. We might kind of rush this though, because we probably want to get on to other stuff. Sorry, what were the three things? Fresh Pro air. Protected from lights. Yeah, no direct air. sunlight. Like, uh, lighting like this would be fine, because it's not ultraviolet. Yeah. But you wouldn't want to expose it to any sort of UV or... So like keep it in the cupboard, basically. Yeah, but there, if you have a cupboard that's closed, you might not get the ventilation. If you're checking on it a lot and letting it breathe, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I usually just keep it behind like a little, like I make a little temple for it, like put a tapestry or something. And that keeps the dust out, keeps the fruit flies out, but lets it breathe so also. Keep it covered, so ventilated. Doesn't glass do a good job control of control. blocking UV? It blocks A and B. I mean, yeah. 98%. Yeah, it's probably fine. Yeah. You usually, like, what's in the bad and, and it, like, keeps out the good. That's why, like, you get skin cancer more likely if you're, like, indoors and stuff like that with light exposure to a glass. The brown glass is supposed to be more protective. And so a lot of people use brown glass when bottling, and you could get these in brown glass if you wanted to pay more money, but that's supposed to be more UV protective. But I really don't know that much about glass and UV, but... I just keep it in a cool, warm, dark spot. That's another th thing that's cool about the Jun is it likes cooler temperatures and it's a faster ferment. So kombucha is like, really wants to be around 80 or above, like 
not too hot, but somewhere around 80 degrees. Um, Jung can be just fine at like 60, 70. I like to ferment at 80 degrees because it's quicker. Um, kombucha can take two weeks-ish, maybe even 20 days. Jung, I do my first ferment in three days. So that's a lot faster, better turnover. There's, it's just better in every way. It's just because those strains just happen to move quicker? Yeah, they just have a different metabolism. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's from the Himalayas, maybe it's from Portland hippies. We don't know. <laughs> Would you mind holding that for me? Yeah, of course. So yeah, this is... Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cool this off first. So another important component is that your honey is raw. If you have cooked honey, processed honey, um, a lot of that stuff has corn syrup in it anyway, which is weird that that can be a thing. <laughs> but if you have honey that's been cooked, it destroys the, the enzymes and the native. So bees have their own bi microbiome. They have their own hive, fungi and bacteria. And they actually will take pieces of the comb when they colonize, colonize a new hive because that's their immune system too. Um, they use it to to stave off like invading bacteria and stuff, along with propolis and other stuff. But yeah, so don't cook your honey. In Ayurveda, they say it creates a very special kind of toxin that's really hard to get rid of. Uh, it's kind of unsubstantiated, but I believe it for some reason. <laughs> Why is it that places started? Because we are obsessed with cleanliness, and we think that pasteurizing things is a good Honey idea. Is perfect on its own. <laughs> yeah, botulism can exist in honey. Yeah. It's like a really harmful bacteria. It's an anaerobic bacteria that you can make really, really easily, and is incredibly deadly. It'll stop your heart. Yeah, <laughs> incredibly deadly and incredibly easy. So even a tiny deadly. bit can give you really bad it's food a, it's poisoning. It's in the soil. Right? It's, every, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah, that's why they say not to give honey to babies. Because they're more sensitive to botulism. In the Ayurvedic tradition, that's the first thing they do, is give honey to babies. Yeah. <laughs> they, put, they put a drop of honey on their tongue, and they, they speak a, a Sanskrit word that's not coming to mind that means speech. And that's to like let them know that life is sweet and to sort of give them, impart them the gift of speech. Like even, I, don't, I, I see a lot of Indians around, so I, I'm not so sure I believe in the botulism thing. Well, there might be some survivor bias going on there. Yeah, maybe there was some, some uh, loss to the cause. I don't know that much about botulism. It's Botox. That's what, bo yeah, botulism, because it paralyzes your face. Um, so yeah, now we've got... <laughs> Can I use some of your water, JJ? Yeah, that's why I brought it. Perfect. I got botched. I got botched. So I like to add the honey when the water is still warm, but not... Like, so 120 degrees is when they say that these enzymes are destroyed. So I don't have a thermometer, but if it's, if it's too hot for the back of my hand, it's too hot for the honey and the culture. So it's probably perfect oh, hey. for the honey. Yeah, let's see what this is. Is this clean? Because I'm about ready to introduce. Get out of here. I'm about ready to introduce some, some microbes. So this is the most vulnerable point because we have, well, we haven't added the honey. Quarter cup of honey, three quarters cup of honey is, is what I use per gallon. And I find that's a really nice ratio. And with that low, some people use a cup, but going a little lower, you're going to reduce your chances for alcohol which is important to me because I'm doing it commercially. And if I have alcohol, I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What temperature did you say to keep it below? Uh, below 120. So I usually shoot for like 108 because it's a magic number. And it's warm enough to melt my honey, but not burn it. And I, I usually don't like to add the culture at that temperature. I like to bring it down more to the 80s, 80 degrees. Do you even bother taking the temperature anymore? Is this all intuitive? This I do temps in my, lab, in my lab, in my brewery, but I don't here. I don't want to make it because I, like, I can tell that this is probably like 
110 or 115. As long as it's not burning the back of my hand, the sensitive part of my hand, mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to burn the, the culture or the Maybe honey. Hot tubs is good training for that temperature knowledge. Hot tubs? Yeah. <laughs> It'll educate you. <laughs> so I'm adding the honey slowly and stirring it like this so it helps it dissolve because otherwise you'll end up with a big, and I'm still going to end up with a big clump of honey down there, but we'll figure it out. And I kind of overfilled these jars because I knew this was going to happen. It takes a little, you can get a spatula in there and get it all out. Or I can actually pour the liquid back in, which I probably will do. Because that's fun. How do you sanitize your jars and temperature readers and stuff? Is it like boiling water? Or? I use chemicals, but I try to use good chemicals. I use star sand, which is just an acid-based thing. Or I scold. I just heat it to boiling. If you're doing it at home, just boil all your utensils. Everything that's going to touch the culture should be scalded. And that's usually enough. Also, what we're doing is we're, this is a technique called back slopping, which you take the previous culture and you add it to that and it brings the pH down. So only things that thrive in the low pH will, and there's not a lot of like bad stuff like that's going to survive a low pH like that. I mean, it's possible you can get some weird molds and stuff, but those are easy to detect. Um, but we're not going to do that quite yet. You ever like a cool pH strip? Mm -hmm. so I do that, yeah. So I, I start with a pH around 5 or 4.5, and I want to end with a pH around 3.5. I find that's where most people prefer. If it gets down in like the, the twos or threes, it's going to be too acid, and you can take the paint off your walls. Make a mess here. Actually, I probably won't do want? that. No, it's fine. I'll just I'll deal with that later. So yeah, it's mostly dissolved. Um, I didn't bring a, a proper stir. stir stick, but it'll it'll sort itself out eventually. So just let that cool off a little bit longer, and then we just dump this in, and that's the magic part. Um, and then it's ready. Yeah, and then, and then you just like. And then we just in. put it in a nice. Nice place. Perfect. It has has the air flow, flow, no light. Yeah, take a look at that. It's it's not super well developed. Some of these are better than others. That one's not that happy, but it's it, it's in the fluid. Yeah. I I can start like we could start a culture off of this. Yeah. 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 But the having having a nice pellicle layer is a good way to ensure that it's like viable and it it gives it a good it's head like start. Healthy. Yeah. It's like its immune system. It yeah, it's, it keeps it isolates it from spores that might be floating around. It like capitalizes on that and keeps every competition out. So is the scoby more developed than the drink here? Yeah, so there's no there's no pellicle. Cellulose. Yeah, no cellulose in these that I can tell. There's a couple of little yeast strands and a little bit of bloom you can see at the bottom. That might be some of the flavorings that I've used might be some... But if you left that longer, would it develop into... It would get thicker and thicker. And it, it eventually will, like, crowd out. Like, if you just left it here, the liquid would disappear and the, it would just become all, all pellicle. And that's actually a storage strategy, is it in that cellulose is a little bit of nutrient. So it's, like, metabolizing and storing and hoping for more nutrient to come its way. It's a really fascinating so, creature. You store it in a fridge. Oh, sorry, go ahead. You can, like, I have a jug that I've just been building up the pellicle for the past few ferments, and it just gets thicker and thicker. And as long as, like, what, what's the risk of just keeping it in there and using the same one? Um, because entropy, everything rots, and oh. it'll go. It, I, I like to use young, fresh pellicles because it's less musty like the yeast will die the bacteria will die like things are going to be constantly moving towards decomposition so keeping it fresh and and vital like throwing out the old one and you can see when they get tired like they don't have the same vitality so i, I look for like sort of a perky bright tight like if it gets if it gets kind of thin and gelatinous 
I'm, that's not a healthy culture, in my opinion. But if it's like nice and thick and you know like coherent, that that looks healthy to me. So just selecting for that, and also I, I rinse mine between batches because I'm trying to favor the bacteria, not the yeast. So the bacteria is going to live in that top layer more, and the yeast is going to be in this the solution and those strains. So you might see some brown. Like, You're trying to favor the bacteria and not the yeast. Yeah. Okay. Because so what the do you yeast. Rinse it in? I, I rinse it in old kombucha and yeah. I, I'll like yeah. scrub my pellicle lightly and get the the brown dingy looking stuff and that has that has more of a yeasty taste it's not bad but it can tend towards like a dirty sock kind of <laughs> you know you taste the kombucha like that I'm sure yeah, yeah. The smell man the vinegar smell yeah. is overwhelming did you smell this one well no not here in our house when we were doing a lot of kombucha it was just Super yeah, smelly. this one's a little over where like it's it's mature because it's like vinegary, but it still smells like nice. And fresh. Hey, I like it. I, that smells good to me. Yeah, it smells good to me too. Oh, I don't, don't want to smell it. Yeah, get your nose in there. Share, share your micro. If you get your mustache hairs in there, you're just sharing the biome. <laughs> you want to smell it? <laughs> So this is probably ready. And this is the part when I like to do my prayers and bless it up with my intention. Because as you're introducing it, I feel like there's some sort of like sexy magic, like sperm in the egg type of thing. What's up? Um, I made kombucha one time and I was waiting for it to cool, you know? Yeah. And I poured my, my scoby in and, um, and then in like a week there was this, this layer of mold on the top of my um, kombucha and somebody said that it was maybe because I didn't let my tea cool enough before adding the scope. Yeah, so you might have killed or shocked the culture uh -huh. and then the molds in the air were like, oh, free lunch, let's get in there. And so that can happen. Okay, so, so if you just pray you longer before... Cool, cool if you want it to cool a lot, it's okay at this temperature. I'm, I'm going to rush it, which maybe I'll give it a little more cool water. There's maybe not room though. That's another thing I should talk Just about. Wait. We yeah, wait. we can wait. So the, uh, the depth to surface ratio is important because of the gas exchange. I don't love these. I, I use them because they're available locally. Uh, there's a packing supply down the road that sells these for very cheap, like $3. Uh, so I use them. I don't love them. I like something that more, more like this shape that has more surface area. Um, in, in the brewery, I've upcycled some kegs from like Red Rock and Uinta Brewery and Epic. They, they have like decommissioned kegs and we cut the tops off and made like a big giant, you know, 10 gallon fermenter. That's what I use. Um, but when I'm not using that, I prefer, you can find these two and a half gallon glass ones with a little lip around the rim. I really like those. Uh, singing bowls are super fun, like a, a good crystal singing bowl. I think that's pretty magic. Yeah. It's very expensive. I've broken one before. It's not that cool. Um, so I think this is ready. So uh, take a moment with me and, and bless this thing up and just welcome it to the world and try and shine all your love and gratitude on it. And mm -hmm. I always have my own prayer sort of like, you know, maybe for our health and our healing and like abundance and, you know, whatever it is that comes to mind you just set your intention and and bless up your batch and it, it may sink it may float that's okay if you don't see a new film forming in a couple of days then it's maybe a problem and then I didn't actually bring a cloth this is going to be for Sultan's son. I'm going to leave this as a gift for the, uh, the space. Mm -hmm. So, unless you guys don't want to take care of it. <laughs> but if you guys want to take care of it. have done all the hard work already, so. Yeah, but you got you to gotta keep doing this. And if you don't want to keep doing it, you can let it die or give it away or something, but. So, yeah, what, what would the second, uh, you're taking the liquid out, leaving the scoby in, and then brewing a new batch and pouring it into the same. Yeah, so next time I made this, I would just take the, the pellicle from the top, and ideally, I'm actually going to take some of this out. So you'll wait three days, and that's when you could 
test it first to see how it is. Yeah. And, and it could be ready then. Yeah. And then is that when you add in juice or fruit or herbs? Perfect. Secondary ferments are awesome. And that's how you build carbonation. So these bottles are cool because they're not going to blow up. They're super sturdy. Don't get square ones because they don't distribute the pressure right. They have flip tops that are square and they'll blow up more easily. Don't blow up your stuff. Just check on it. <laughs> if you leave it alone, it will eventually become a time bomb. Uh, yeah, I, I was doing it. I've never been trained, but I was doing it anyway. Yeah. I had it in a bottle in the kitchen, and I forgot about it for a while, and then I opened it, and I was like, oh. And it just, like, it just, it was a volcano. And yeah. And the ceiling was covered in <laughs> who knows what. I left some plum puree in one of these jars, and it bulged at the lid, and we didn't know what to do. Uh, so I'm like, just poke it. Let the gas out. Popped it. It shot to the ceiling, like, in a place like this. Like, plum puree everywhere, and it peeled the paint off our walls. It was, <laughs> it was nuts. <laughs> But you're not a mad scientist if you're not blowing things out. So. Yeah. Maybe use safety goggles the first few times. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you could put an airlock on it. There are bottles with airlocks that'll avoid that problem. As in, like, they'll let the right amount of air out. But it won't carbonate. Where can you get bottles like this, like those good ones? Um, so these I buy at the Beer Nut. In the case of 12, you can buy them single. Uh, I think that they are about you know, two or three dollars, maybe four dollars a piece, something like that. Beer nut? The beer nut. It's a homebrew supplier. It's on State Street, like, <laughs> between 13th and 17th. Yeah. yeah. A good strategy is just drink Grolsch. Yeah, exactly. Get and some good ginger beer. beer. And then I save get, your bottles. Yeah, I, I buy yeah. expensive soda sometimes. Mm -hmm. and just, nice. Yeah, and these bottles are cool. You're I not going to lose the lid. Yeah. So if you, if you get a good bottle and you... It's only as good as your lid is, because you're going to lose that lid, it's going to break, something's going to happen to your lid, and then your bottle's not good anymore. These come all attached, so it's really cool that way. I prefer flip tops. They come in all sizes. You could do 16, 32, gallon, whatever. Uh, I don't think I've seen any bigger than a gallon. I've had a lot of problems with those kinds of lids sealing. Is there a trick? Like, when I just brewed beer, and a lot of times those types of lids will, for whatever reason, give me issues. Um, I think as long as this bailing wire is intact it shouldn't be. and the rubber yeah I've the rubber out. like there's cheap ones from ikea that are just the block just that part and there's no rubber I don't know. yeah if, if your rubber is good and your wire is good i've i never had a problem it might just be the brand that you're using the ones that come in oh really i i've never had a problem yeah i don't know i don't know what to say about that so yeah i do so let's talk about secondary ferment. You can do all sorts of things. And this is when you use your volatile herbs like that you can't put in your primary ferment. So say you want a rosemary, it's okay to put it in your secondary ferment. It won't build as much carbonation perhaps if you use something like that, but you're not gonna kill your ferment. So you can get the flavor. And I treat each herb differently. If it's a root, I boil it, get like the goodness out of it. If it's a flower, I lightly steep it. Maybe some warm water, maybe just cold water, depending on the delicate or hardiness of the whatever you're putting in there. For fruits, sometimes you can chop them up and that's good enough. Puree is really good. If you put frozen fruit in, it's really nice because their cell walls are all burst and they just, just bleed right out into it. Mm -hmm. But adding that extra sugar, you're adding more potential energy. That's when the carbonation builds which is really nice and satisfying when you have like a good carbonation build, but it's a, it's a time bomb. And if you don't pay attention, you have a problem. So more sugar is more time bomb. Yeah. M more potential for disaster. More yeah. And more potential for delightful bubbles. But it'll still like work, right? You don't have to be super accurate about how much sugar. No, I, like I really shoot from the hip on the secondary fermentations. Most of the time I have to measure now that I'm doing it professionally because I have to do repeatable batches but most of the time i put like how much fruit in there <laughs> you know whatever whatever however strong you want it um using herbs with high volatile oils actually preserves it like make it last longer so that's why we have ipas is because they wanted to put beer and send it to india so they just chalk it full of hops and that helped it not go bad as quickly so you can slow the fermentation down by using 
antibacterial herbs like lavender, rosemary, oregano, tarragon. tarragon huh? Exactly. I don't know. I've just heard it. You could do that. This one's tarragon. I'm just kidding. It's because he has tarragon. So, would you mind doing a quick, like, step by step overview? Yes. So, you like make the tea, like a gallon of tea, and then um, you got to cool it down. Yeah. And you could, you could do the, the way the crash cool that I just did, or you could just be patient and okay. do like a whole gallon. Okay. Yeah. And then three quarter cup of honey. Mm hmm And then you add the scoby, is that what you're calling it? Yeah. Is, do you need a certain amount or does that need to be? Um, about 10%. Okay, about 10% scoby. So I use the, I use the cup. Um, it was a little extra sour, so it's, it's bringing that pH down low. If it wasn't quite so sour, I would use like a cup and a half because 10% of a gallon is 1.6 cups. So somewhere around there. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, and then you cover it with something that's going to keep the fruit flies out. Yeah. It could just be as simple as a paper towel. If you do those, if you, you should rethink about it, but... <laughs> We're gonna close this door so it'll be warmer. So if you guys want to scooch in. And how long, how long do you wait to like let it sit for? About three days for the primary ferment, okay. and then the secondary ferment is you can do it chilled actually, which I like to do because it it slows things down and lets you get a really nice thorough extraction. Um, but you could do it at room temperature also. Okay. So three days primary ferment, and then you would pour it into one of these. Yeah. And add whatever. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. Yeah, add your extra stuff, or you could just have it straight. It's really nice without. Oh, the primary ferment is good straight. Yeah, like the straight John is just fine. We like fruity, exciting, <laughs> elaborate flavors, yeah. so it's fun to play. <laughs> but you use sugar instead of it needs to ferment. Yeah, and, and you'd probably want to use a kombucha, uh, proper kombucha culture, not a jun culture, because it's, it's going to be more accustomed to the sugar. And you could make your own by a bottle of vi viable tea. Um, the commercial ones are getting weird. They're putting strange bacteria in there that are even genetically engineered uh -huh. to, to halt al alcohol fermentation. They're introducing other strands that is not so traditional. And there's like spor spore probiotics that are exceptionally shelf stable, but there's they're not as they're going to be transient. So um, as opposed to the lactobacillus that are more delicate in the homebrew, for sure, those are actually like getting and they can like actually colonize in your gut and grow. Um, so there's a lot of benefits for doing homebrews instead of the store bought. For sure, I'm glad you brought that up. And also, some kombucha companies will take uh, concentrated kombucha and reconstitute it to make it taste like how they want and to shorten their brew time. And they cut a lot of corners. It's really sad what they're doing professionally and passing it as kombucha. It's like quick breads for kombucha, basically. Yeah. yeah. They're doing all sorts of weird stuff. So, yeah, brew your own or buy mine. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you sell yours? Um, we sell it at our brewery uh, up in Salt Lake, breweries in Provo. We have Rugged Grounds by the Green Pig, uh, Kings Peak Coffee Roaster, um, Yoga Sune and Rontopia. Yeah, Rotopia. yeah and we'll, we'll be hopefully expanding our reach. We've been kind of focusing on Provo, but then they decided that green tea is bad, so we we need to we need to break up with Provo. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's for the best. Yeah, we're moving on to better things. I it's think. Not you, it's not for sure. Can I ask when you do the flowers and the herbs, do you pour in the water that you steep them in, or sometimes I just steep them right in the in the the vinegar you or the when the you like boil the roots. Or yeah. When you so you know, like if you did ginger or something, yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. you pour in the water, or do you just pour it all in? You could or? you could do either. I like to put the whole plant in there. I like to. I like to activate it with the hot water, like get it in suspension and broken down a little bit. And then I add that to the, to the gin. And I, I like to think about 10% is good for additive. I don't know why the rule of 10 seems to work for everything, but about 10% juice or additives is 
which it could be a very strong tea that you make, or you could use whole berries. Like, there's a lot of different strategies for secondary ferments. Um, and I'm going to give you guys some, some really good resources for everything that I just said about like, the sequence and stuff. You can find a really nice printout from Kombucha Camp with a K, Kombucha and Camp with a K. Um, they have really good step-by-step -step with pictures, and they're, they're really nice. They have support. Uh, if you need anything, they have like really nice homebrew kits. There's a couple of different ways. Uh, you guys know about the continuous ferment, the flow-through kits? Mm. So you take something like uh, the water, something you the put spigot. this. Yeah. I don't necessarily love that because the, the spigot is plastic and having vinegar and plastic together grosses me out because it's going to be breaking it down. But you can get ones that have metal or wood taps. And those, as long as it's a stainless steel and silicone is the most stable for the gasket. So those are cool. And then you just add fresh tea and you can just do a flow through. I think that every two or three times you should wash your SCOBY and get all the, the dead yeast out of there. But that's like the most convenient way to do it. Sometimes I just keep a SCOBY in my, my clean canteen and I'll add fresh tea to that. Like when I'm hiking or backpacking, I'll like just ferment as I go. Just oh, that's super fun. so cool. Yeah, yeah, it's really fun. And then you can like be like, oh, juniper berries, and put them in your oh, thing, or like whatever you want. It's super fun. Pine needles. Little Rock Canyon elixir. elixir. Shoot, yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah, Kombucha Camp is a great resource. Also, Reddit Kombucha. Those guys are cool, and they will tell you everything you want to know, and they're really proud of what they do. Some people are wrong, but usually they get corrected by the mob. So, <laughs> So that's a pretty safe bet to like get some more information. Does it seem like most people are pretty obviously not always, but protective about their like recipes and stuff, or does it seem like everyone loves to want share? To spread this yeah, to they're a really world. open community, yeah. and they want to, they want you to do your best kombucha ever. Aww. Yeah. Twenty twenty best kombucha. So. Um, does it matter if there's chlorine in the water? Yes. Yeah. And it'll kill it. Mm -hmm. It's not terrible. It stunts it, I think. I've done it with tap water. I'm not going to be proud of that, but I've done it. And I find that spring water is the best. Depending on the purity of your spring, though, you might want to make sure you get it hot enough because you don't want to introduce any weird cultures from your spring. She, she's been getting spring water in Centerville, for, is in Centerville for a long time, and then the, like it was high in sulfur and it caused some issues maybe. Like, well, I was doing water keeper though. It was no. water keeper. Yeah. But it might be. It could be weird if you have, some springs have weird stuff in it, so um, you could use RO water, reverse osmosis, but that's, there's I don't, no yeah, there's no minerals in there. Mm -hmm. I think the kombucha likes, like the microbes like some minerals, and I think you like some minerals, so I don't use that. Uh, spring water, I think, is the best. Um, you, could get, you could buy that or, or, or gather it yourself. Um, or you can, when you boil the water, a lot of the chlorine comes out because it's a gas and it just burns off. You're not going to get the fluoride out, but, you know, that's, spring water is best. Well, could you go over just real quick again the process for re like the upkeep? So yeah. That. So here comes a three days later. We come and check on this. It has this, the beginnings of a new culture. So I would take, you know, a cup and a half of that along with the top culture, and I would just repeat the steps. Make some tea, sweeten it up, cool it down. We'll cool it down, then sweeten it up, and then add the culture again. So just rinse and repeat. And then with the gallon that you pulled off, you do a second fermentation. Yeah, then you, you pour that into your bottles and you can let it build carbonation. There should be enough, depending on when you catch it. I like to catch it when it's still a little sweet and stop it because then it has potential to build more carbonation in, in the, the secondary fermentation. Or you can add, you can add, some people add sugar at that point. They'll straight up put a teaspoon of sugar in a bottle. And that will ensure you get good carbonation, but watch out because it's going to blow. Or use fruit sugars or, or natural, any sort of plant will have a little bit of something to ferment. And that, that'll go on like that. So yeah, I think that's about all I have to say. You guys have any more questions? Do you want to hand out kombucha and Q?
keep, maybe people can keep asking questions and we can break bread, eat. Yeah. So, well, this is a strawberry rhubarb mint. Really like this one. Pretty fresh. This one is a ginger lemon schnozberry, which has... It does taste like schnozberry, promise. <laughs> it has hawthorn, rose hips, schizandra, and raspberries. So the spring where we get our water had rose hips and hawthorns growing right next to each other. And I wanted to do a ginger lemon berry. And I was like, what could I use? Hmm. <laughs> and so that's... Rose hip and hawthorn are both amazing medicine. So, yeah, this is a good vehicle for the medicine also. The honey will bind the... The sugar soluble, like water soluble stuff, will bind to the honey, and then the vinegar will extract the fat soluble things. So you're getting a double extraction on your herbs, which is like a full spectrum thing. This one is all Utah Valley. The apricots come from a tree that my dad planted before I was born. And then we took the apricot pits and made an amaretto extract. I don't know if you've ever eaten an apricot pit, but it's more almond than an almond. I thought about it, but not not the whole pit. You got to break it, and it's yeah. got a little guy I mean, inside. Yeah, the little thing inside it looks Something. like an almond. And it has cyanide or whatever. Yeah, um, the Persian ones are the best ones, and really, you'd have to eat like an ungodly amount before it became a problem. Cyanide's weird because it doesn't. It's a metabolite. Like it comes from something in here, metabolizes into cyanide, and it doesn't hurt you until it kills you. <laughs> <laughs> like there's no problem. Yeah, there's no problem with having a little bit until you've reached your saturation and then you just die. <laughs> but you'd have to eat, like, a lot. So I'm not worried about it. I've, I chug this stuff all the time. I'm still alive. Do you ever do elderberries? I do. I'm working on elderberry Osha one right now that I'm so happy about. Do you, do you cook those before? I do cook you, them, yeah. Because I think they have cyanide in them. I don't know what is is about elderberries, but I ate a bunch, and it made me very I've I've very eaten poopy. them a lot raw, and it, your mouth starts to get like prickly uh, before no. it, you would die. Or, like. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sur survived really by the <laughs> survived. So yeah, the, this has the amaretto and then tarragon from Hum House, which is Raquel sister house. Yeah. Beautiful little place down there. Um, so the tarragon's from there. The only thing that isn't from Utah Valley is the green tea because it's hard to grow green tea in Utah Valley. Um, but that's from Grey Mountain Herbs, which is a Provo company. So yeah, that was super cool. So yeah, we'll have that with dinner. You guys can pour that around. You guys are welcome to look at these books.